Hi there. Recently, I have written an article where I have told about the decision process behind my attempt to replace rice with hanami in our microservices ecosystem and why I decided not to do it just yet. Please keep in mind that this statement was made before even Hanami 2 Alpha versions had been officially released. I will post this article in the description of the video so it will be the first thing you will see if you open it up. The important part was that rewriting my Hanami applications to Rise took me less than a day and I was able to do so because of how I and my team tend to structure code in our web applications for the recent years. Then I have gone through this great article about using service objects in Rise applications and it plucked my heartstring. At first I thought another article about service objects which I personally hate. But almost instantly a second thought came to my mind revealing that I'm actually a super fan of service objects. I just don't name them this way. I use more abstractions and extract dependencies out for better clarity. So in this episode, I will show you my version of service objects that allowed me to replace one Ruby web framework with another in a complete service in less than a day. But a little disclaimer here, this was a very small API only service. In the next couple of minutes, I will go through refactoring the onboarding endpoint to the structure we use in our microservices ecosystem. Maybe it will inspire you to improve your code bases and if it will, Please send me your ideas so I can learn from. Enjoy! I have here a simple Rails API application with a single endpoint that allows me to register only a single user. I did simplify it for this video but wanted to implement a few hidden functionalities so it is enough to visualize the benefits of the refactoring. Just please keep in mind that the more complex the problem your application solves is, and the bigger your project grows, this technique will give you more and more benefits. I have tested it in small microservices, but also in big monolithic applications with hundreds of endpoints available. So I have this single endpoint that creates a user and you might think that it's the only thing it does, but is it really? It returns an error where another user had already been registered. A different error when the request body is wrongly formatted. One more when there is no authorization header and finally the validation errors where user validation fails. If I will visit the controller, you will see that even for this single action, there is quite a lot happening. At the very top, you have the authorization check, which I have just implemented as a placeholder for this showcase checking if the authorization header is present. Then, when there are specific errors reason, I'm rescuing from them calling proper error rendering methods. Still, this single control action does several things, and there are some issues hard to be seen and tough to debug, and this is a super simple one. My experience from big rise projects shows that one can never underestimate how big rise controllers may become. Let me go through some of the issues hidden here. You can see that it first authorizes the request. It's not ideal because it happens before params deserialization. This usually means fetching objects from database, like the auth application or current user, which might result in unnecessary DB queries. I have written a complete test coverage for this project to refactor safely. And this particular case had been cut by one test example. Then we have the validation check, rendering validation errors in case of failure. Here is another common problem hidden. The user might be valid for creation, but to update the user, you could need different validation rules. In this case, you will end up with conditional validations, which are very hard to be tracked. Also, when your application supports multiple API versions, it may be possible that in the older API version, your user was valid, but then you had added more validation rules to this user and the new API is not backward compatible. API versioning when we have validation stores in global active record models is very hard to maintain 
And this is the main reason I'm avoiding storing validation logic inside of the models. Then finally, we have a business validation rule that prevents our action to succeed. It's not about validating the input. The request body is completely valid and the client has an access to perform the request. But at the current state of the application, this action is not allowed due to business condition. These kinds of checks are something I often see in Rails controllers or models, but I love the approach coming from domain-driven design, where the business logic is aggregated in a completely separated object. Each of these steps can potentially be a bit complicated, like validating the request parameters or checking if the business rules allow for a given action to be performed in the current application state also then can vary between multiple requests. It makes total sense then to not keep it all in the controllers, right? However, in most trials applications, all those steps tend to be squeezed between model and controller without too much thought behind processing the business processes. If you will add 10 additional actions to the single user model, you will easily end up with a big mess. So writing service objects for each and every action in your controller is pretty useful. Now let me refactor this code to make it more straightforward, more scalable and more reliable. I will use three gems to do that. To easily create objects which list several steps to perform and better handle errors, I will use dry monads and its do notation. With this gem, I will be able to ensure that all my objects always return the same type of values, either success or failure, which can be easily cut, compared and processed later. The second gem is dry matcher. It's a pattern matching for Ruby that puts error handling to the next level. It has built-in integration with dry monads, so it's a natural candidate to be used as a comparison engine for different failure objects. Finally, dry validation is the best validation engine I know. I use it in all my projects for years already to extract my validation rules out of active record objects. While I will go through the implementation pretty fast in this episode, if you are interested in deeper dive into any of those gems, let me know using hashtag suggestion and you can consider sponsoring me on GitHub to get bigger impact on future episodes content. Going back to the refactoring. First of all, I will not start from the service object. A service is an object that performs a single business process, so it should not be concerned about any of this authorization or validation stuff. It makes sense then to not call it directly from the controller. This is why when I implement my Rails endpoints, I'm always starting from creating the endpoint action object where I list all the steps that are required to perform the single action. It accepts a rack request and returns the serializable response. Writing your controller's actions in the way they are rack compatible is the first step to create truly framework agnostic web applications. It will contain a single call method as the only interaction point. I try to make all my projects callable so it's easier to maintain communication between them. Then I will include the result monad so I can access success and failure objects directly without prepending them with dry monads and enable the result matcher with do notation. Now let's list the steps. First, I need to deserialize the request, getting the parameters and authorization data out of it. In this case, authorization will be just a token for simplicity. Then I want to check the authorization logic, but only after validating the format of the request body. If this one succeeds, I call the validator to run validation rules. Only in case the validation passes, I call the create user service object to actually try performing the business process action. This way, my create user service can be easily called from other places of the system, like background workers, or the developer console where I don't need, for example, authorization check. Each of those steps is an endpoint dependency. 
the action object is only concerned about what to call and in which order, but the detailed logic is hidden in separate step classes. Let me implement them very quickly. The first step is the serializer. It is supposed to ensure that params and headers are in valid format. The call method also accepts the rack request and returns either success or failure value. First, I need to get the params, then validate the format using the serialize method. Then I get the authorization data. And at the very end, I return success with the extracted parameters. Now let me implement the missing methods. The deserialize method does pretty much the same that the controller did, but it catches the parameter missing error and returns the failure object instead. The fetch token method also just extracts the token out from the authorization header. Just for simplicity, I extracted the token from headers. You may replace it with JWT token decoding or whatever else you need in your application. The second step is to authorize the action using the given parameters and authorization data. It may happen that in between step will be required to fetch additional data for the authorization to proceed. And you can imagine how easy it would be to add such here. My simple authorizer will just check if the token extracted from the header is present. But you may imagine that quite complex authorization rules might be listed here. Again, it returns either success or failure. I hope you start seeing the pattern here. Because of the fact that all my objects return always the result monad, I'm free to handle all of them in the exactly the same way. The third step is the actual validation. In the user object, I have the presence validation for name and email, and also the uniqueness check for the email field. Let's replicate that using the dry validation here. At the very top of my validator, I'm loading the monads extension to make my validators compatible with success or failure objects I return in my other steps. You may place it in the rise initializer. First, let's define the basic validation rules. They will be already more powerful due to the built-in type checking. First, I need the name to be required and present with the type of string. Then I repeat the same for email and wrap those rules into the params coercion block, which does the basic value transformation at the beginning. If you are interested in details about it, I strongly recommend you to visit the dry validation documentation page where this is explained deeply. Now let me write the uniqueness validation for email. This will only be checked if the basic validations passed. I add a custom rule for email, which returns a failure for this attribute key with the given message if the user with this email already exists in our database. However, I don't want to make my validator coupled to a user class, so I inject it as a repository using the option feature. Then let me go back to the action and during the initialization of the validator, specify that the repository that should be used by the validator is a user class. This makes it extremely easy to test in an encapsulation, as I can just inject anything to my validator that responds to the exists method, so there is no coupling to tutorials or active record objects. Finally, I call the create user service object with the value that is returned from my validator. At this point, I'm 100% sure that I'm always working with the valid input parameters, correct types and values, so I can easily skip validation or raise unexpected errors if such situation happens. You may notice that I tend to call my service objects operations. The same I did for validators instead of contracts, but that's irrelevant. Call them however you wish, just be consistent. Let me create the service object quickly. Again, the object has a single call method. It fails if there is already a user registered, then creates a user and returns success otherwise. You can easily extend it to schedule some notification email or do other fancy updates. But the core thing here is that none of this stuff is application related, but rather performs the business process. 
With this, our endpoint is pretty much done. Finally, let's go back to our controller and clean it up. I can pretty much remove everything from here, replacing the method with only a single line calling the given action object. The call action method takes care of the error handling and this is where we make use of dry matcher integration. I will define it in the application controller. It accepts the given action and calls it with the rack request. Then, in case the action is successful, it renders an empty body with the status got from the result. In case it's a deserialization issue, it returns a bad request HTTP status code. And respectively, for authorization failure, the forbidden error is returned. Where a failure is a validation object, then we can render the validation errors with unprocessable entity status code. And when business logic fails, we can return something else like a teapot with a detailed message provided. Finally, if there is another type of failure returned, we can return the 500 status code. Let's run our tests and check how many silly mistakes I did. Oh, first silly mistake is here. I have closed the brackets too soon in the line of integrating dry matcher. Easy. Let me fix it and try again. The second error says that there is no method to monad for a string. This means in the deserializer, I forgot to return success or failure, but return the raw string instead. This is also pretty straightforward. One more try. Ah, I don't return status in the success call. Let me visit the action again. And done. Please pass now. It did. Awesome. I just recalled I have forgotten to remove validation from the user model yet. But if I will, you will see that all the tests still pass. The refactoring is completed. There are of course pros and cons of this approach. Is this code easier to read? I would say so, but it requires more jumping between files and there is more code to be read. It's way easier to test, so you can practice complete test-driven development without an effort. It's more scalable and less error-prone. It allows me to update files projects easily or even replace one web framework with another in no time. However, the drawback is that more actual code needs to be written. I have designed this years ago for our Rails applications, and I was amazed when I have discovered that Hanami actually evangelized a very similar programming style and conventions. If you consider trying Hanami after years of working with Rails, you will meet more such programming styles where dependencies are injected from outside and the single responsibility is encouraged for your objects. So to summarize, don't be afraid of putting more abstractions to your systems. If service objects are supposed to only handle business processes, maybe calling them directly from the controller is not the best approach. Instead of naming everything service, I name objects based on what they actually are, and this reduced the amount of code that needed to be refactored when I needed to change frameworks, or more often, when I need to update the Rails or Hanami in our projects. I hope you have enjoyed this episode, and as always, I would like to say thanks to my GitHub sponsors. I appreciate the support as it allows me to create better content and it speeds up the development of the Hanami web framework. If you enjoyed this episode and want to see more content in this fashion, subscribe to this YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter. As always, all links you can find in the description of this video or in the hanamimastery.com. Also, if you have any suggestions of amazing Ruby gems you would like me to cover or ideas on how to improve, please mention them in the comments. Have a great day, you are awesome, and see you in the next Hanami Mastery episode.